On the morning of Wednesday, August 26, 1992, two grandparents from Wethersfield, Connecticut, arrived at Orly Airport outside of Paris for a celebratory visit to the fabulous capital city of France, where they were to spend an exciting week with their son David and his family. At the airport, Margaret and Robbins Barstow were warmly greeted by their two grandchildren, Susanna, age seven, and Jeffrey, age 13, accompanied by son David and his wife, Linda. Yeah. We see you. We're here now. Huh? Hello, Dad. Dad. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Dad. How are you? Oh, it's nice. We're all set. Yeah, we're all set. And there's the bag. The Barstow grandparents had come to Paris to celebrate with their children and grandchildren their 50th wedding anniversary. David Barstow, a computer scientist, had been transferred a year earlier from his job in Austin, Texas, to work for three years at the Paris headquarters of his employing company, Schlumberger. So he and his family had found a place to live on the outskirts of Paris, and we all decided to make the best of it by having a family reunion in Paris to celebrate our anniversary. As grandparents in our 70s, we still loved to travel, but we had never yet done Paris. So we were greatly excited at our grandchildren's promise to give us a personal tour of this wondrous city of light. Since this was a work day in the middle of the week, our first stop was at the large Schlumberger office complex where David heads up a team of six computer research scientists. So this is the Schlumberger site in the center of Mont Rouge, Paris, which is just south, just south of Periphery, so it's technically not part of Paris, just over the border. And my office is in that building over there, about, uh, well, it's on the other side of the building. There are actually about 2,000 people here who work at uh, this Schlumberger site and the Schlumberger Laboratory for Computer Science, the European branch, has six of them. Great. Right. We're headed over this way. Has six of those people. Has six of those 2,000. After leaving David at his workplace, we drove with Linda, Jeffrey, and Susanna crossing over the Seine River to their temporary home in a Parisian suburb known as Crossy sur Seine. Their rented house is in a friendly residential neighborhood and the name of the street they live on is Rue Van Gogh, number 23. We were immediately made to feel right at home, and even the dog, Sally, barked a welcome. We found that the four Parisian Barstows had adapted very well to their new short-term environment. Oh, uh, bienvenue, Chez Barstow. Jeffrey was a superb host and house guide in the best French manner. To the Barstow house in Croissy sur Seine. Would you like a tour of the house? We certainly would. Thank you very much. This is very superior meals. Uh huh. This is the exclusive me and our own native chef, Madame Barstow. Ah, bonjour, Madame. Qui est là? 
that is our family on a vacation in the United States. Okay, Beth. This is the lounge. You may enjoy cocktails and relax at any time of the of day or night here. This is the backyard. Please feel free to use it to all your enjoyment. Ah, swing set. That is and for uh, the guests. That is the guard dog. Ah, yeah. Oui. Uh, yes, uh, come on, uh, Chappelle. Her name is Sally. Sally! Sally! Yeah. You follow me? <laughs> you follow me, I will show you the upstairs rooms. Repair. Uh, 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 it is equipped uh, with all the latest in electronics for your personal enjoyment. <laughs> yes, you both do. I have video cassettes. Ah, uh, down. This is the ballet room. If you shall need me at any time, please feel free to call. Simply knock twice on the door and I will come out and I will come out and assist your need whatever it is. This is a room for the younger guests. Mm. This was Susanna's special room with a variety of books and toys. The last room that Jeff showed us was his parents' master bedroom with their wedding photo on the wall, along with collages of family photos of each of them from earlier years. We certainly would. Okay. Thank you very much. In your car. In my car. All right. In my driving. Can the whole family go? Absolutely. Seven seats in the car. Good. We Thank appreciate you. the uh, guiding tour of uh, Jeffrey and Susanna and you, three in one. That's, That's right. great. Okay. You can be at the playground. And so we started out for our first introduction to the magic of Paris. Crosse sur Seine is situated along the river to the west of Paris, so we approached the city from the west. And here we got our first view of the magnificent Arc de Triomphe, standing at the western edge of the city like a giant entrance gate. Linda skillfully navigated the huge traffic circle around the arch, and then we were driving down one of the most famous avenues in all the world, the Champs-Élysées, heading straight for the heart of Paris. At the end of the avenue stands the Egyptian obelisk, marking the great square which is now known as the Place de la Concorde. And the obelisk is in the middle and there go the erect the Place Fountain from the Place de la Concorde. And uh, that's the Reeve Ghost, that's the... 
And then we got our first view of the Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower over there. And that's... And are we crossing the Seine now? Yes, we're crossing the Seine, and there's gold things on the Pont d'Alexandre clock. Right here is the National Assembly. And now we're on the Reeve boat. That means the left bank. bank. Heading down the Boulevard Saint-Germain. Ah, oh, yeah. I should have looked at where I was going. This is the left bank. It's where the Sorbonne is, and it's sort of the intellectual center, the old intellectual center of Paris. Student quarter. This is the corner of Boulevard Saint-Michel, Boulevard Saint-Germain. That building is the Pantheon. This is a grandchild's view of the sidewalks of Paris, walking through the left bank, university section of the city, also known as the old Roman or Latin quarter because in early centuries they spoke Latin here. It was fun to think of authors like Ernest Hemingway walking these same sidewalks in the 1920s. The first thing that I wanted to do so that Robbins could be a knowledgeable grandfather was to buy a copy of the weekly Periscope magazine, providing a guide to This Week in Paris. Our first major point of interest this afternoon was to be the famous Sorbonne University, an early part of which was this elaborate Roman-style church built in the 1600s and housing the remains of the powerful Cardinal Richelieu, so dramatically fictionalized in Alexander Dumas' novel, The Three Musketeers. The Sorbonne, France's most famous university, had its beginnings in the year 1253, with only a handful of students listening to street corner lectures. But by 1400, it had become the headquarters for the University of Paris and had over 15,000 undergraduates. The university has had a checkered history, but over the centuries, the lecture halls surrounding this courtyard were the academic homes of such great teachers and students as St. Thomas Aquinas, Roger Bacon, Dante, Erasmus, Descartes, and John Calvin. Jeffrey had seen on Broadway the musical version of Victor Hugo's masterpiece, Les Miserables, so he especially appreciated this statue memorializing the great French writer. Also in the courtyard is a statue of Louis Pasteur, who founded the science of bacteriology and whose medical discoveries brought about the prevention and control of many previously fatal diseases. We could not help, help thinking here about how many millions of grandchildren around the world today owe their lives to this great 19th century Frenchman who studied at the Sorbonne. Just down the street from the university has located our main objective for this first day's excursion, the Musée de Cluny, the medieval Cluny Museum of early artworks and relics built on the site of the city's ancient Roman baths. Um, over there, you can see where the Roman ruins are of the baths. They were built around the second century AD. And over here, you can see where the Gothic arches are. This is the Middle Age house that was built adjacent to, actually connects with the Roman baths. What made this site especially attractive for our younger tour guides was the availability of an outdoor playground where they could amuse themselves while the older generation folks went inside the museum mansion to view its exquisite treasures. So, leaving Susanna in the care of her older brother Jeff, Linda, Meg, and Robbins set out to find the antiquities located indoors. The most famous display at the Clooney Museum is exhibited in a dimly lit, high ceiling circular room, around the walls of which are hung a series of magnificent storytelling tapestries, six of them dating back to the 15th century and known as the Lady and the Unicorn. Each of these hand-woven tapestries colorfully portrays a richly clad lady in the presence of a white unicorn and a tawny lion. There are fascinating interpretations of the symbolism involved in these elaborate panels, but five of them depict the lady demonstrating to the unicorn the five human senses. In this first one, she's showing the sense of sight by having the bearded unicorn look at its own image in a handheld mirror. 
In the second panel, the sense of sound is depicted by the playing of a miniature organ with the assistance of a lovely handmaiden. In the next panel, with a standing unicorn and lion, the sense of taste is illustrated by the lady taking sweet from a bowl. The sense of smell is shown by the lady holding a garland of flowers against an incredibly rich and detailed background. Finally, we have the sense of touch, with a lady reaching her hand out to touch the long, straight, pointed horn of the mythical unicorn. Notice that the horn is depicted with small grooves spiraling upward, making it very much like the real-life tusk of a small species of whale known as the narwhal, which is found only in Arctic waters. And in fact, displayed on the wall here, above these Clooney tapestries, is an actual six-foot-long narwhal tusk acquired from some Arctic whale hunter. It is reported that in late medieval times, narwhal tusks brought back by early Arctic explorers were claimed to be the horns of unicorns. In any case, viewing these magnificent hand-woven medieval tapestries at Cluny is an unforgettable aesthetic experience. When we got back to the playground, we found that Susanna was anxious to show us one of the exciting modern-day wonders which she had discovered. Susanna, you like doing that? Yeah. Is, is all After this, what better way could there be to wind up our first day of Parisian sightseeing than for grandparents to treat daughter and grandchildren to soft drinks at an outdoor sidewalk cafe near the university. Good. Susie, what are you drinking? The next day, Jeffrey and Grandfather decided to undertake a joint photographic expedition. We started out at the circular fountain at the Place de la Concorde with the Eiffel Tower in the background. This is where, during the French Revolution in 1793, the guillotine was set up which beheaded more than 1,300 victims. The obelisk of Luxor was originally erected along the Nile River around 1300 BC. It is 76 feet tall, covered with hieroglyphics, and was given to France by Egypt in 1831. It stands in a direct line between the Louvre and the Arc de Triomphe. It is a mile-long walk down the Champs-Élysées to the giant arch, but school children and retirees seem equally to enjoy it. The famous Grand Palace along the way was built for the World Exhibition of 1900, and I was particularly impressed by the monumental sculpture of a chariot and four horses charging a breast which covers the rooftop corner. Jeffrey didn't allow the traffic hazards on the avenue to interfere with his quest as an expert photographer for just the right perspective. The two of us thought it would be fun to try to record on film, each in our own way, something of the wonder and the glory of the Champs-Élysées and the historic arch which crowns it. Jeff created a remarkable photographic essay of still pictures, and I took these scenes with my video camera. The Arc de Triomphe is the largest monument of its kind ever built. This colossal stone archway is 164 feet high, 148 feet long, and 72 feet wide. It was conceived by Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte in 1806 as a way to honor his soldiers for their military victories, telling them that, like ancient Romans, they would go home beneath triumphal arches. There are four heroic, larger-than-life sets of sculpture on the walls of the main arch columns. The first one here dramatically depicts a call to battle with the spirit of France urging the soldiers on. 
On the walls inside the archways are inscribed the names of scores of famous battle sites and military officers. On the left side wall of the main arch there is a second giant sculpture portraying the crowning of Napoleon as emperor. Napoleon himself was dethroned, exiled, and died before the arch was even half completed. It was not actually finished until 1836 under King Louis Philippe, at which time it was finally dedicated to the glory of France's armed forces. As we move now to the south side of the wide pedestrian walkway surrounding the arch, we can clearly see that the monumental structure is a four-way arch with lesser but still massive openings extending through each side column and with friezes depicting famous battles up above them. Experiencing firsthand this incredibly awesome architectural masterpiece moved me that evening to write this poem reflecting on the arch's significance. Majestic, strong, and powerful, it stands implanted at the head of double-breasted boulevards, a monumental tribute to the dead. The victories it celebrates, alas, are those achieved in war, where thousands upon thousands killed each other, ordered by an emperor. And in this latest century, to halt the Nazi tyranny of millions slaughtered, Brave men died so all could live again in liberty. This towering arc gives honor to one kind of glory from the past. In future years may triumphs rise from heroes' deeds achieved in peace at last. Throughout the day in the open spaces between the lofty pillars, people of all ages congregate, overawed by such towering majesty around them. The names of people and places carved upon the walls are largely commemorative of military exploits from the Napoleonic era. Under the pavement between the columns on the east side, however, there has been added in the 20th century the tomb of an unknown French soldier from World War I, marked with an eternal flame. And the inscription, Here reposes a soldier of France who died for his country, 1914-1918. Many people do not realize it, but inside the main columns of the arch there are a circular staircase and an elevator by which observers can ascend to the top of the monument where one can walk around the rectangular perimeter of the roof and peer out on all sides. The views of Paris from this vantage point are fantastic and present great photographic opportunities for grandson Jeff. Looking to the east, down the broad avenue of Champs-Élysées, toward the old part of the city, one can see in the distance the Egyptian obelisk at the Place de la Concorde, with the Louvre spreading out behind it. On the right can be dimly discerned the twin square towers and pointed steeple of the Notre Dame Cathedral. The long, sloping hilltop on which the Arc de Triomphe was erected is known as l'Étoile the star, because from it as center, twelve major avenues radiate out in all directions. To the south, one avenue leads across the Seine to Paris's other sky-filling landmark, the Eiffel Tower. Most of these radiating roadways were laid out in 1854 by Napoleon III's radical city planner, Baron Haussmann, 
who ruthlessly tore down all the existing housing and other structures that stood in the way of his grand 12-point star design. On the opposite side of the arch from the Champs-Élysées, one follows the Avenue de Charles de Gaulle westward to the remarkable new urban development known as La Defense, with a giant modern aluminum arch surrounded by contemporary glass and steel high-rise buildings. Continuing our panoramic circle, we can see what an extensive metropolitan area Paris encompasses. Barely visible on the north horizon is the Sacre Cour Basilica, topping the famous artist district known as Montmartre. Back now to our starting point, all the way down the Champs-Élysées is another triumphal arch known as the Arc du Carousel, with a four-horse chariot mounted on its top. This much smaller arch, also ordered by Napoleon, stands in front of the courtyard of the greatest and most famous museum of art anywhere in the world, the Louvre. The open courtyard of the Louvre is surrounded on three sides by palatial buildings added one after the other over the centuries to make a giant rectangular horseshoe. As one gazes in awe at these ornate stone-blocked structures from the past, one is startled to find in the very center of the courtyard a striking 70-foot-tall pyramid built of glass, steel tubes, and cables designed by the famous Chinese-American architect I. M. Pai. It was installed in 1989, nearly 200 years after the opening of, to the public of this historic royal museum. The pyramid now serves as the main entrance to the museum, providing a gigantic skylight over the spacious, modernistic new underground lobby where there are ticket offices, shops, and eating facilities. From the glass-protected surface opening, we descend to the lobby on escalators to start the tour of multiple rooms and hallways where Grandma and Grandpa were able to see in one afternoon more world-famous original art masterpieces than we had seen collectively before throughout our entire lives. We can only include a few samples here, but perhaps the Western world's most famous sculpture is the armless Venus de Milo. Carved in marble around the first century before Christ, it sets in stone an ageless ideal of the female form. Almost equally famous is the winged victory of Samothrace, discovered in 1863 on an island in the Aegean Sea. Dating back to 200 years before Christ, this headless marble masterpiece may have stood on the bow of a ship. So realistically does the tunic cling to her body, we can almost feel the wind and spray. The Mona Lisa, painted in the, by the 16th century Italian artist Leonardo da Vinci, has been called the most famous painting in the world. It is a portrait of the wife of a Florentine nobleman, the mystical setting in the almost imperceptible smile of her delicate mouth and self-confident eyes lend an aura of eternal mystery to this enigmatic woman. This is a powerful sculpture by the Italian Renaissance master Michelangelo. Called the Bound Slave, it profoundly portrays his suffering while struggling to free himself from the tight bonds. Does it symbolically represent the human soul enchained by the weight of the human body? Moving now to the Holland section, here we have a self-portrait by perhaps the greatest of the 17th century Dutch artist Rembrandt. He made many studies of his own face, seeking to understand how its features reflect moods. This searching portrayal at the age of 54 shows Rembrandt's mastery of color, radiance, and shadow at the height of his career. Another 17th century Dutch artist exhibited at the Louvre is Vermeer. This painting, called The Astronomer, shows Vermeer's remarkable ability to capture the play of light from the window on various surfaces. There is harmony and richness, a quiet beauty and dignity, raising this work to perfection. In 18th century France, many court artists emphasized the sensuous beauty of the female body. 
The soft color and texture of the skin are remarkable in this painting by Boucher showing the huntress Diana getting out of her bath with the assistance of a handmaiden. Finally, representing 19th century revolutionary France, we have this large dramatic bureau by Delacroix entitled Liberty Leading the People. It reminds us of the student-led revolt in Les Miserables with Delacroix himself wearing a top hat and brandishing a gun, following liberty over the fallen bodies of his comrades. It was raining when we finally emerged from the unforgettable maze of the Louvre, adjacent to the Seine River, and Meg and Linda headed for the Metro subway to get us back to the Barstow family temporary residence in crosset sur seine The next day was to be a momentous one when we would be joined by three other family members. Well, what a week we've been having, Oh, huh? boy. Oh, it's been great. Well, we're glad to have you. Hey, we're glad to have to 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 say, to say, say goodbye. Nice. We, we've had this whole extra week here with you. Yes. It's been marvelous. Yes. But now it's time to get the whole family together. And we've arranged to meet Dan Where? and Eva and Cedar. Where? At the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel, oh, Tower. Eiffel Tower? Oh my goodness. Off to the Eiffel Tower and we'll bring them back. We will. We'll all go. Okay. Between the Arc de Triomphe and the Eiffel Tower on the north bank of the Seine, there are some spectacular fountains on the grounds of the monumental museum complex known as the Palais de Chalot. Looking south from the palace's broad terrace, one is rewarded with a superb view of the Eiffel Tower in its fantastic entirety. Extending over 1,000 feet up into the heavens, this incredibly awesome structure was erected over 100 years ago in 1889 to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution. It was designed by the master French engineer Gustave Eiffel, and for 40 years after it was built, it remained the tallest man-made structure on earth, not being surpassed until 1930 with the Chrysler Building in New York City. There are three built-in platforms, a large lower one, a middle one, and a distant top one for observers to enjoy. Radio and television equipment now cover the top of the tower. Still awed by the sight of this overpowering edifice and eager to examine it more closely, Robbins and Meg headed across the bridge over the Seine toward the base of the tower, looking for the newly arrived three other members of our family. And sure enough, there they were, ready to greet us with open arms and excited spirits. On the right, our daughter Cedar Barstow from Boulder, Colorado, and on the left, our younger son Dan and his wife Eva, who had flown in from New Britain, Connecticut. As we approached the tower, we were tremendously impressed by the revolutionary exposed way in which Eiffel had joined massive beams of structural steel and pig iron lattice work to create this colossal, symmetrical, all-metal skyscraper. He anchored it on four giant legs, spaced equally apart, making it so stable that even in the strongest winds, the top does not sway more than four and a half inches. The total weight of the metal tower is 7,000 tons. Before making our ascent, we stopped beneath the overarching framework to eat a picnic lunch, sharing bits of it with the pan-handling pigeons that seemed to be everywhere. The entrance to the tower is through a gateway in the east pillar, which hosts a slanting elevator used to transport visitors up and down inside the mammoth leg. 
This is the first of two elevator systems within the tower, and we crowded into this one to be taken up to the first and second platforms which encircle the core of the structure. This is a dramatic ride with tantalizing glimpses of the disappearing ground below. When we got to the second level, we emerged onto the open platform, crowded with tourists, literally from all over the world, and tried to find a spot by the railing for our first panoramic view of Paris spread out on all sides before us. <laughs> The second elevator system provides a vertical lift from the middle level platform all the way to the top inside the central shaft of the tower. It presented an awesome prospect, but this is what we had come for. We had to wait our turn to enter the elevator cab, and when we finally started up, the ride seemed to last forever but it was an incomparable thrill to watch the girders pass by the window and to look out at the surrounding area from a constantly increasing height. This isn't any higher than you do it. The platform at the top has two levels, the lower one enclosed by protective glass panels. The upper level is open to the sky. We wanted to absorb the view and take photographs first from the lower enclosed level where we didn't have to worry about the wind and fenced in railings. Using telephoto viewfinders, we tried to locate recognizable landmarks, such as the Notre Dame Cathedral. Looking eastward over the rooftops toward the older central part of Paris, we could see emerging from the heart of the city the dividing waterway of the Seine River. It runs right through the middle of Paris, and there are almost too many bridges to count linking the right and left banks. The Eiffel Tower is situated on the south side of the river, and the famous Champs-Élysées and Arc de Triomphe are on the north side. From this distance, the triumphal arch seems almost like a miniature model. Moving to the open upper level of the top deck, we get a close-up view of the maze of weather, radio, and television equipment surmounting the top, and we gain an even broader view of the surrounding environs. Moving our sights from the Arc de Triomphe down to the river slowly drifting by below us, and the bridge crossing it at the foot of the tower, we now could appreciate from a different perspective the beauty of the gardens and fountains we had seen earlier beneath the terrace of the Palais de Chalot. They give life and grace to the grounds of this extensive museum complex which dominates the hillside above the river. Still crossed by many bridges, the Seine wends its way westward into the also crowded but less populous suburbs of Paris. Right below the tower on the south side is the Champ de Mars, an all-open grassy park 
providing welcome relief from the surrounding masses of buildings. Using binoculars and taking countless photos, we spent most of the afternoon looking out over this unparalleled vista, alternately shadowed by clouds and illuminated by sunlight shining through breaks in the clouds. Before leaving the top, our attention was called to the parade of large, elongated, river-going boats, which we could see constantly plying the Seine with sightseeing passengers. That, we thought, should be our next excursion. Finally, we all descended in the lift to the second-level platform and then decided to walk down the rest of the way on the iron stairways. Yes. Do you want to go down the stairs or do you want to go down the elevator? Stairs. Okay. What do you want to do? I'm going to go the first section down the stairs. The Eiffel Tower had to have been the high point of this trip. The next day, we did indeed go on a boat excursion on one of the famous bateaux mouches, which carry hundreds of passengers every day for two-hour rides up and down the Seine. This time our granddaughter Susanna served as our family tour leader, escorting Grandpa down the gangway and then up the stairs to the open upper deck where we could get a much better view. These motor-driven boats are built just for this purpose and depart every half hour from a loading platform in clear sight of the Eiffel Tower. Linda had prepared a delicious chicken lunch for us to eat on board. Well, I don't too late. <laughs> Later. <laughs> Too bad, Dad. <laughs> As the boat pulled out and moved slowly along the river, we were given a running commentary in both French and English. Heading east, parallel to the Champs-Élysées, we pass numerous bridges with a wide variety of styles and sculptures. Before long, on the left, we can see the obelisk at La Place de la Concorde, with former royal palaces in the background. Then on the right, we catch a brief glimpse of the French National Assembly building. Not far beyond this, also on the right, is the famous Musée d'Orsay, originally built as a railway station, but now transformed into an outstanding art museum, especially noted for its exhibits of 19th century Impressionist painters. As we pass the outside of the Louvre over to our left, scarcely recognizable from this viewpoint, we come to the part of the river where long stone promenades have been constructed along the edge of the water. These romantic walkways have long been popular with lovers, children, and artists, and they have also been a favorite setting for films. Now we come to the ancient heart of the city, and we encounter the first of two large islands right in the middle of the river. The boat takes the branch to the right, and we pass the equestrian statue of the famous 17th century French king, Louis XIV, known as the Sun King. 
Students and tourists alike frequent both banks of the river here, where the walls are lined with bookstalls and local art displays. The old Sorbonne University is not far from the river's edge and the various bridges that cross to the heavily built up islands. The foremost island, the Ile de la Cité, is the site of many historic buildings. And it is here on this ancient island that we find one of the world's most famous cathedrals, the Notre Dame de Paris. Construction of this architectural masterpiece with its two massive square towers was begun in 1163 and completed nearly 200 years later in 1345. For over 600 years it has been a central part of French history and religion. Located on a mid-island site used in earlier centuries by Gauls and Romans, the Notre Dame Cathedral combines beauty and strength to give honor and glory to Our Lady of Paris, the Mother of Christ. This statue of the Madonna and Child, dating from the 14th century, is the best known of the 37 representations of Mary found within the church and clearly demonstrates the veneration which marks all of the cathedral's great works of art. During hundreds of tumultuous years, the original building has undergone changes and restorations, but it remains basically the same, except for the addition of the tall pointed spire over the chancel roof in the middle of the 19th century. Among the church's most famous features are three giant circular stained glass windows known as the roses, high up on the front and side walls. Structurally, each one is perfectly patterned, with brightly colored panes of glass radiating out like a sunburst, supported by a symmetrical stone framework. Only one of the windows now contains the original colored glass used when first erected, but their construction required tall, thin walls for the cathedral. Looking skyward out through one of these windows from the inside, one feels an aura of ethereal magnificence. The square tower on the left, here undergoing repairs, houses the mammoth thirteen-ton bell which Quasimodo rang in Victor Hugo's epic novel The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Viewing the interior of the church later in the day, we were struck almost with unbelief at the towering height of the Gothic arches vaulting over the long central nave and chancel. The galleries on each side are upheld by rows of majestic columns, giving the cathedral a seating capacity of nearly 10,000 for mass and organ recitals. As our boat passes the south side, we can see the flying buttresses used to support the tall, thin walls from the outside, a fantastic architectural innovation of the Middle Ages. From the east tip of the island, Notre Dame seems almost to float like a vast stone ship above the Seine. Continuing our boat trip now, around the Ile de la Cité, on the north side, we head back past our original starting point to view the Eiffel Tower from a different perspective. Further along the river, there is a remarkable reproduction of the Statue of Liberty, much smaller than the New York Harbor Monument given to the United States by France in 1886. But here, together, are the images of two of the most famous symbols in the world, linking our two countries in common cause. And so our tour of the Seine is concluded, and we have had a truly awesome family excursion. On the following day, it was grandson Jeffrey's turn to take us for some final city sightseeing, starting with the indescribably ornate and opulent Grand Opera House of Paris. Designed by Charles Garnier, it was opened in 1875, a monumental mixture of competing styles of architecture and sculpture. Jeffrey appears almost dwarfed by the tall arches and pillars covering the building's facade. This exterior circle of joyously disporting naked dancers shocked some 19th century sensibilities, but it was just one of the flamboyantly multifarious works of art displayed throughout the gigantic showplace. 
the broad marble staircase in the foyer branches out into two great sets of upper stairs and balustrades leading to the main hallways on the second floor. The lighted ceiling high overhead is adorned with colorful metaphorical murals, making this Parisian opera house a stunning hybrid of palace and museum. Behind the curtain and in the auditorium is one of the world's largest stages with room for up to 450 performers. The hall is surrounded by five tiers of luxurious red and gold loges, but the auditorium actually seats only a little more than 2,000 people. Beneath the Chagall painted ceiling hangs the six-ton chandelier made famous by the book and musical The Phantom of the Opera. Outside the opera house, we found a sidewalk organ grinder. Our final stopping place was very unusual. Through this fancy Forum de Hallis gateway, we went down into a giant underground mall in what is called the belly of Paris. Here we found perhaps the world's most unique aquarium, the Parc Oceanique Cousteau. Conceived by the famous French explorer Jacques Cousteau, it's a waterless showcase for the underwater world of our ocean-covered planet. Opened in 1989, it takes visitors through three-dimensional marine exhibits with models and films of all kinds of sea life. This is the strangely beaked Amazon River Dolphin. Instead of viewing fish in tanks and captive dolphins in restraining pools, we experience the world of marine mammals through moving visual close-ups of these animals as they truly are free in their ocean homes. The most memorable feature of Cousteau's Parisian aquatic park involves the nomadic blue whale, the largest animal ever to have lived on our planet. As shown in this wall display, it has a heart as large as a small car. And on exhibit in this underground hall is a truly awesome life-size model of a female blue whale, 33 meters long, over 100 feet. This model has been constructed in such a way that through an opening on the side of its body, a person can walk right up to its giant red heart and then proceed down a passageway inside the whale, underneath its mammoth backbone and past its lungs and other organs. On the right side is a model of a fetus, a life-size, amazingly large, unborn calf still inside its mother's body. Going through here is an impressive experience. Our Paris touring now completed. The entire Barstow family gathered at a beautiful country manor outside Paris for a weekend celebration of Robin's and Meg's 50th wedding anniversary. With a scrumptious feast fit for a king and queen, 
daughter-in-law Eva and son Daniel on the left side of the table, daughter Cedar, other son David, granddaughter Susanna, daughter-in-law Linda, and on the other side of Grandma Meg, grandson Jeffrey, all joined in counting the infinite blessings which half a century of mutual caring and sharing had granted us. On our last night before leaving the City of Lights, we took a farewell drive under a full moon. We hope you've enjoyed this Barstow travel adventure film. We'll be releasing more of Robbins Barstow's home movies on this YouTube channel during 2021. Click here to subscribe and receive the latest updates. Meanwhile, enjoy these other films by a master of home movie storytelling in the pre-digital era.